Welcome everybody. Um, welcome on such a wet and windy, wintry evening. Um, I'm Sarah Franklin and I'm very pleased to see you all here. It's a very special occasion tonight. Uh, tonight's speaker, Kevin Jennings, um, is one of the most influential leaders in the field of LGBTQ education. And he's here at a very important moment uh, for this university. Um, education is a terribly important field um, for gay people. Kevin and I both grew up in the United States um, in the 1970s <laughs> during the Save Our Children campaign, spearheaded by the singer Anita Bryant, um, and specifically aimed at opposing gay rights, one of the first major campaigns against gay rights. Like Clause 28 here in the UK in the 1980s, Save Our Children was very concerned with the toxic influence of gay people as educators. Uh, indeed, until very recently, a majority of people in both the UK and the US felt it was inappropriate for gay people to be involved in teaching. Kevin has been among the most influential teachers, authors, activists, and policymakers to challenge this long-standing prejudice. He's the founder of Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network, and he was instrumental in establishing the first LGBTQ program at Harvard University, his alma mater. He's one of the founders of Gay History Week, and he has worked tirelessly to make education a safer experience for gay people. Kevin went on to serve in the Obama administration's education department, where he became a villain of the current alt-right movement. Um, he's the author of several books on gay rights and education, including an autobiography that details the extreme prejudice against gay people he experienced as a child growing up in the South. A theme throughout his work and in his lecture tonight are the many intersections between homophobia and other forms of discrimination, including sexism, racism, and able bodyism. These intersections are, of course, very prominent in the news today due to the rise in right-wing populism and white supremacist discourse, which now enjoy a level of open endorsement from elected officials holding the highest offices, not only in the United States, but across Europe. And I'm really sorry to say that sentence, because um, you know it feels like the 1930s, but it does feel like the 1930s. So this is a time when it is more important than ever for universities to support challenges to the current backlash against progressive social change on all fronts. Kevin's lecture tonight is the first in a new program supported by the School of Humanities and Social Sciences and housed in the Department of Sociology called LGBTQ Plus at CAM. I'm very excited about this new program because Cambridge has so much to offer in this field. And the aim of the new program is both to increase the visibility of the work being done here by scholars in several di different disciplines and to join up these efforts. World leading scholars here at Cambridge, such as Professor Susan Gollenbach and the Center for Family Research, have played a crucial role in changing the perception of LGBTQ parents. By showing all of the positive benefits alternative families can generate for society as well as individuals. The Cambridge Center for Gender Research, directed by Jude Brown, is another example of a game-changing research and teaching program here at Cambridge that has created an essential home for queer, feminist, transgender, and non studies. New programs and lecture series led by colleagues in English, history, <coughs> modern languages, the medical school, and other departments are putting LGBTQ research on the agenda and transforming our understandings of the curriculum at a time when this field of research has become increasingly prominent and influential within the academy. So we really could not have a better speaker to help launch a program that will help us build even more solidarity and momentum in this field here at Cambridge. 
if you'd like to be kept informed of the next steps in developing website, workshops, conferences, a newsletter, and LGBTQ networks of teaching and research here at Cambridge, please sign one of the clipboards that we'll be passing around. And please join me in welcoming Kevin Jennings to speak to us tonight about why we need more queer and LGBT studies to transform not only the economy, but our world. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. First of all, how's the audibility? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, we had a little bit, as uh, people who arrived on time might have noticed, a little technical challenges, so hopefully we will nevertheless have a good lecture. I want to thank you for inviting me to speak here tonight, and I particularly want to thank Sarah for her leadership and her vision in driving forward the field of queer studies here at Cambridge. I think that uh, there is a saying that a prophet is always hated in her own land, and I want to thank Sarah for being a prophet here and taking on the challenge of getting people to accept queer studies as a valid field of study. So I think Sarah deserves a round of applause. I'd like to know a bit about who I'm talking to. So how many of you are undergraduates? How many of you are graduate students? How many of you are faculty or staff? Uh, how many of you are community members? Great. So um, I deliberately chose the title, although I realized when I said it to Sarah, I said white use or queer studies. I managed to morph it into white use or LGBTQ studies by the time I did my PowerPoint presentation um, with a very deliberate choice of wording. And I'm going to lay out my point of view right at the very beginning so there's no mistaking where I'm coming from. I think it is absolutely wonderful to pursue knowledge for its own sake. I also think that that's not enough for those of us who find ourselves in the middle of a crossroads in history when the future of LGBTQ people is being challenged and our rights are very much still under debate. I think that as scholars, we must always ask ourselves, what use is the scholarship we are producing? If we produce scholarship that only speaks to other scholars, then I would argue that we're not doing enough. Now myself, I began my career as a secondary school history teacher 33 years ago in Providence, Rhode Island, which is in the northeastern part of the United States. Yes, this is what happens after 33 years. Um, and I've had five careers. First, I began as a secondary school teacher. I taught history, as I mentioned. And while I was teaching, I made the decision in 1988 to come out of the closet to my entire school. Now, how many of you were born after 1988? Okay, it's probably hard for you to imagine what 1988 might have been like and how unusual it was to be an openly gay teacher at that time. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later in the talk. But a few days after I did that, in a speech to my entire school, a young woman came into my office and she uh, was not a student I knew very well. She was, in fact, not in my class. I knew her primarily as the hot freshman girl with a hot senior boyfriend who was always making out outside my classroom, which I found somewhat annoying. So when she showed up in my office, I was a bit surprised. And I said, hi, Meredith, what can I do to help you? And she said, I want to start a club to fight homophobia. And I knew her as the hot girl making out with the hot boy, so I was surprised. So I said, well, why do you care about this so much? I'm just curious to know. And she said, my mother's a lesbian, and I'm tired of hearing my family get put down around this school. And I said, what would you like to call this club? She said, I don't know. You're gay and I'm straight. Let's call it the Gay Straight Alliance. <laughs> and that was the first Gay Straight Alliance in the world in 1988, 30 years ago, at the school I was then teaching, Concord Academy in Concord, Massachusetts, outside of Boston. There are now Gay Straight Alliances in over half of all American high schools and in many kinds of schools around the world. So 30 years, I think, things change a great deal. Part of how things changed was from that little kernel in Concord, Massachusetts, in 1988 came the organization GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network, which I founded and led for 14 years to make schools safer for LGBTQ students. That work brought me to the attention of then Senator Obama, who asked me to undertake my third career as a senior government official. I was Assistant Secretary of Education for Safe Schools and specifically charged by the President with leading a national anti-bullying campaign, which I did during his first term in office. I left that to take my fourth career, 
which was to run the Arcus Foundation, which is a charitable trust that is the largest funder of LGBT rights worldwide, as well as a, one of the largest conservation funders. I came to know Cambridge very well during those five years because our conservation office is over off of Parker's Peace here in Cambridge. And then I left that six months ago. You might have noticed I have a new tagline. I'll take you back to it. I'm now president of the Tenement Museum, which is a museum in America that's dedicated to the history of immigration to our country and to fighting xenophobia. One of my nephews called me after I took the job and said, I'm not surprised you're doing this job. Most people, having known me as an LGBT rights activist, said, what's he doing running a museum about immigration? And I said to my nephew, I said, why are you so unsurprised? Everybody else is very surprised. And he said, well, when you spoke at my college six years ago, somebody asked you what the next great human rights fight would be, and you said, immigrants are the new gays. And so I want to keep in mind the intersections that Sarah pointed to. We need to remember that bigotry is bigotry is bigotry. And when I was a young kid, there was a brand of potato chips called Lay's Potato Chips. And the ad campaign in the United States would show someone eating one and then eating another and then eating another. And the slogan was, Lay's, you can't stop with just one. I find bigots can't stop with just one. If they don't like LGBT people, they probably also don't like immigrants. If they don't like immigrants, they probably also don't like people of color. If they don't like people of color, they probably also don't like Muslims or Jews. So I think at this moment in history, we need to challenge all of ourselves to stand in solidarity with everyone who's under assault in this new neo-fascist age in which we find ourselves. So there I am in 1985, 22 years old, teaching secondary school, no training, no knowledge, no nothing, basically. But I would begin every class with my favorite history quote from George Orwell. Who controls the present controls the past. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the past, present controls the past. And I would ask students to analyze what this meant. Now, if an audience as esteemed as you, I won't cold call on you and ask you to explain it, because I know you understand that the people in power in the present tend to teach a vision of the past which serves their needs and their desires. And it is from our vision of the past that we develop our vision of the future. If we cannot see ourselves in the past, we will also find it challenging to see ourselves in the future. For as the black nationalist American leader Marcus Garvey once said, a people without the knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. And throughout most of our lives, LGBTQ people are systematically denied access to our history, origin, and culture, so that we are, in many ways, like a tree without roots. Why is that? Well, part of that is because our forebears lived in much more challenging times than in which we live, in which it was not safe to simply reveal even the fact that you were LGBTQ. A great example of that is Michael Wigglesworth. Michael Wigglesworth was the sort of the poet laureate of colonial America. He was a 17th century colonial poet who wrote a poem called The Day of Doom, which was the second best-selling book in colonial America after the Bible, in which case he talked about the fact that uh, my friend Peter Gomes, who was a professor at Harvard, once said it was sort of like that nursery rhyme about Santa Claus. He knows when you've been sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. This was sort of a theological version of that, The Day of Doom. And school children in 17th and 18th century America grew up in terror of the day of doom and the disaster that would strike if they were sinners. The irony was in the 1950s, a scholar finally broke the code in which Michael Wigglesworth wrote all of his personal journal entries and discovered through breaking that code that Michael Wigglesworth was himself attracted to people of the same sex. He was projecting his own fear and his own self-loathing onto the world at large through his writings like the Day of Doom. So the person, and if you've ever been to Harvard, you know one of the prominent dormitories is Wigglesworth Hall. So the very built into the DNA of my nation was both homophobia and self-loathing. Not so different here in the UK. As you might be, how many of you know of Polari? Uh, if you're not aware of Polari, Polari was a dialect of English that was spoken by queer people, primarily working class queer people, in the 50s and 60s, so that non-gay people would not be able to understand what they were saying. A couple of years ago, a filmmaker here in London 
made a film in Polari, and I'd like to play you about a minute of it if our um, audio works, uh, so you can actually hear what your queer forebears would have sounded like 50 years ago. Nearly got that myself the other week. I just finished plating this chicken in the cottage Ajax Clackett Lane, you know the one. Anyway, I'm mincing outside, wiping the screech. And who should I bump into? But one of your ugly daughters. There's a poof in there, I said. Napped him with his cafes down, I suppose. She didn't have a bar it coming. Must have been a right fair caduza. Shard. You're disgusting. What? Oh, go on. Put your faintness in your little shush bag off your scarper. You forgot your glossy. So what just happened? It's virtually impossible for a modern audience to tell, right? Because the, the language is literally so different than what we speak today that it is unintelligible to us. What the man is actually telling him about is an encounter he had with the police outside of a cottage um, where he was accused of being uh, there for the purpose of having sex. He instead threw another queer person under the bus and said, no, 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 there's a guy in there. And he propositioned me, go arrest him. Which is the point at which the gentleman in the coat says to him, you're disgusting. And gets up and storms away in frustration. So literally, queer people learn to speak a separate language, both in the US and in the UK, in order to protect themselves from discovery. And in many cases, they went so far as to destroy any evidence of their relationships. This is Eleanor Roosevelt on the right. She was the wife of Franklin Roosevelt, the most successful president in American history. This is the woman who, from everything we can tell, was her lover for several years, Lorena Hickok. Lorena Hickok even lived in the White House with the Roosevelts during the Roosevelts' first term. Shortly before she was dying, they would write each other once a week, Lorena and Eleanor. Shortly before she died, Eleanor burned over 4,000 letters she had received from Lorena Hickok, so they would not be discovered after her death. Now we have some of Lorena, uh, some of Eleanor's letters to Lorena are still extant. My favorite one is one in which she says to Lorena, I can't wait to see you again and to kiss that spot northwest of your mouth that is so sweet to my lips. Doesn't sound like buddies to me. Uh, <laughs> sounds a little more intimate than that. But Eleanor Roosevelt, like many people of her time, was aware of the damage that we'd done to her, relation, her reputation if this relationship was known. So she took great care both to conceal it and to destroy the evidence. This creates enormous problems for scholars of LGBTQ studies because the evidence literally has been destroyed, destroyed, concealed, or put in a form that is hard to understand to the modern age. These people were not crazy. They were responding to a world in which being queer was brought under considerable threat. In 1953, our president, Dwight Eisenhower, signed Executive Order 104500, which banned employment of known gay people by the federal government because gay people were considered to be just as big a threat to national security as communists. Many of us know about the Red Scare, but the Lavender Scare, as it was called, was actually much bigger. Over 5,000 people were dismissed from the American government, and the last vestige of the Lavender Scare was not repealed until Bill Clinton did so in 1995. So for over 40 years, it was against the law of the United States government on some level to employ gay people. During those 40 years, by the way, I executive produced a new film called The Lavender Scare, which is about this. You can go to thelavenderscare.com and watch the previews. It'll soon be out at film festivals uh, so that this chapter in our history is not forgotten. In the middle of The Lavender Scare, I'm born, 1963, and I grew up in the Old South. Yes, yeah, so I'm like, cute. God, yeah, what happened? Uh, so, 1963, I'm born in the middle of this homophobic era, a homophobic era symbolized by a CBS Evening News report in the United States called The Homosexuals, narrated by a very famous journalist named Mike Wallace. If you're an American, you know exactly who I'm talking about. He was a host of a show called 60 Minutes for Many Years. Let me play you a clip from The Homosexuals his expose of gay life in 1967. Oh, go back. 
The average homosexual, if there be such, is promiscuous. He is not interested in, not capable of, a lasting relationship like that of a heterosexual marriage. His sex life, his love life, consists of a series of chance encounters at the clubs and bars he inhabits, and even on the streets of the city. The one night stand, these are characteristic of the homosexual relationship. And the homosexual prostitute has become a fixture on the downtown streets at night, on street corners and subway exits. These young men signal their availability for pay. Now this is a very frustrating video to watch on many levels. The first level which is frustrating is the incredible bigotry and stereotyping and homophobia of its discourse. You know, the idea that gay people were incapable of love, that they were all prostitutes, that they were all promiscuous, this very pathologized view of gay people. But secondly, it's frustrating to watch for a much more basic reason. It's literally hard to watch. You can't see anything. Because in 1967, it was not safe for an LGBT person to show their face on camera. So Wallace and his crew literally went to Greenwich Village in New York and filmed in the shadows, which was the only way they could get any images of queer people at all. So it's extremely frustrating video to watch, and it's typical though of its time and of the attitudes that existed towards LGBT people. A time in which my great uncle, Mickey Carmel, was coming up and coming of age. This is my great uncle sitting on a, a 40s car when he was a, probably about the age of many of the undergraduates here. My great uncle was a legend to me growing up. My family was extremely poor and had very little. So that at the holidays or birthdays, there was rarely money for gifts. Often between paychecks, there might not be enough money for food. My uncle Mickey always showed up on my father and my aunt's birthdays with a bag full of gifts. He always showed up on Christmas morning with innumerable wrapped presents. He would show up with bags full of groceries between paydays. He always made sure my father, who was his nephew, and my aunts, his nieces, were taken care of. My father so idolized my Uncle Mickey that he named my older brother Mickey in his honor. Uncle Mickey died when I was five years old, so I never knew him, but I knew all about him. I knew everything about Uncle Mickey, except the fact that he was gay. A fact that was carefully hidden by my family to me until my aunt revealed this to me when I was in my 40s. My Uncle Mickey was also revered because like a lot of queer people, he served in the military. He's the man in the front in the darker jumpsuit serving in the American Air Force during World War II over here in Europe. And the revered role Uncle Mickey played in the family would be hard for me to overestimate for you. This veteran who made sure his nieces and nephews never went without. As I mentioned, I never met my Uncle Mickey who died when I was five. I decided I wanted to figure out how he died, so I went to the state of Massachusetts archives and I got his death certificate. My Uncle Mickey died of what's called portal cirrhosis of the liver. I called a friend of mine who was a doctor and I said, what does that mean? And he said, it means your uncle drank himself to death. At age 54, in 1969, two months before the Stonewall riot, my Aunt Beryl would find Uncle Mickey dead in his apartment, his alcoholism having finally claimed his life. That was the world for queer people before Stonewall. The Czech dissident, Milan Kundera, once said, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. One powerful use of LGBTQ studies is the struggle against forgetting. The struggle against the forgetting of lives like that of my Uncle Mickey. And by doing so, resisting those who would erase us from the historical record. Things were not so different in England. As you might know, this last year was the 50th anniversary 
of the decriminalization of homosexuality in England, which occurred in 1967, thanks to the passage of the Sexual Offenses Act. So by the late 60s, things are beginning to shift for queer people, both in the UK and the United States. The Stonewall Riots take place in 1969. For those of you who don't know that event, the police would routinely come into gay bars in both the UK and the United States, rough up the patrons, extort money from them, blackmail them. They came into a gay bar in New York City in 1969 called the Stonewall, began to do this again, and the patrons said, not today. And they beat the police up and drove them out of the bar, and three nights of unrest ensued in the Greenwich Village neighborhood of New York City, after which things would never be the same for LGBT people who turned a corner and the concept of coming out of the closet came into vogue with the idea that we would challenge the closet which for so long had been held us inside and denied us our rights. <clears throat> One of the major mistakes of LGBTQ studies, though, is to overemphasize the importance of the Stonewall riots. There's sort of this notion that there was before Stonewall and after Stonewall, that before <laughs> Stonewall there was nothing, and after Stonewall everything was okay. Not to scare you, uh, but things were not okay after Stonewall. Uh, in the 1980s, as Sarah was referencing, uh, Prime Minister Thatcher here in England uh, passed Clause 28, which forbade the promotion of homosexuality in schools so that it was literally illegal to teach any LGBT content in schools here in the UK. That law reminds me of the quote by the lesbian academic and poet Adrian Rich who said, when someone with the authority of a teacher describes the world and you're not in it, there's a moment of psychic disequilibrium, as if you looked into a mirror and saw nothing. So for young queer people, going through school up until very recent times was the experience that Adrian Rich describes of looking into a mirror and seeing nothing. That certainly was my experience in high school, and I just want to say, it takes a brave man to put up a picture like that. Um, that's me as a high school senior, um, and uh, I learned absolutely nothing about LGBT people in my school years. I'm curious, looking back to your primary and secondary years, how many of you were taught anything positive about LGBTQ people in your primary or secondary classes? I see three hands. So, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Now, at the same time as I'm coming of age in the late 70s, early 80s, a new generation of scholars are coming of age as well, who are determined to reclaim the past, which has been so systematically defaced and disguised by our forebearers. And I want to pay tribute to a few of them that were inspirational to me. First was this man, Jonathan Ned Katz, who in 1976, published the book that you see on the screen, Gay American History, a Documentary History. What Jonathan did was go back and find documents all the way back to pre-colonial times proving that LGBT people have existed for all of American history. This was the first gay history book I ever had. And I'll never forget it because that book was like being thrown a life preserver to a drowning young person. A history major, in university who was learning nothing about his own history suddenly found a book that said you have always been here. A second scholar who inspired me was Will Roscoe. Will Roscoe was a specialist in the history of Native Americans, the people who preceded the arrival of white people and, people and African Americans in North America. He in particular covered the story of the person on the right, Waywa. Waywa was the ambassador of the Zuni people of New Mexico to Washington, D.C. and the Cleveland administration in the 1880s. Waywa was what was called a Berdash. A Berdash was a person who had a vision during their adolescence that they had multiple gender identities. And they would often live their life in the, the sociological role of the opposite sex. Waywa in particular was biologically male, but she lived her life as a woman. If we were to impose modern language onto Waywa, instead of the language she herself used, we would say that Waywa was transgender. Now, to the Zuni people, like 140 other Native American tribes in which the institution of the Burdash has been documented, it was actually considered a gift to be a Burdash because you had been given a special vision. You had been given special powers. You, in fact, were better than the person who only had one gender identity. 
and therefore you were esteemed and upheld, and so, so much so that the Zuni sent Weiwa to Washington as their ambassador. I want you to pause for a second to consider how remarkable that was in the 1880s. It would be like if Trump suddenly decided to send RuPaul as the ambassador <laughs> to the court of St. James. The Zunis upheld Weiwa as an extraordinary gifted person. In Washington, they literally had no idea what to make of her. This is what Will Roscoe's scholarship taught me which was that homophobia and transphobia is not natural, but it is a social construction. And that in different cultures and in different time periods, those attitudes were not shared, and in fact, very different attitudes were held, with the Native Americans being a classic example of that. Third set of scholars that inspired me, Elizabeth Kennedy and Madeline Davis. Elizabeth and Madeline wrote a book called Boots of Leather, Slippers of Gold which was a history of the lesbian community of Buffalo, New York, a city in the western part of that state, before the Stonewall era. Now, this book blew my mind for multiple reasons, one of which was, unlike Jonathan Katz's Gay American History or Will Roscoe's book about Weiwa, this was the story of a community. And that was a new thing for me to think about because typically at that time period, Maybe there were a few scattered gay individuals, but there was no community. And what Madeline and Elizabeth documented so beautifully in their book was the existence of a lesbian community dating back to the 1930s in Buffalo, New York. A fourth scholar who inspired is George Chauncey. George Chauncey wrote the seminal book Gay New York in the mid-1990s. This book stood out for the fact that it did the same thing for New York City as Madeline Davis had done for Buffalo and prove the existence of an LGBTQ community long before Stonewall. In fact, the book ends in 1940. The second thing that George Chauncey did, which blew my mind, was he was able to show the variety of ways that people constructed and understood their identities and themselves that went way beyond being gay. And the final scholar that moved me was Eric Marcus. Eric Marcus did an oral history called Making Gay History, which documented the LGBT movement in the United States back to its beginnings in 1924 when Henry Gerber founded the Society for Human Rights, the first gay rights group in America in Chicago. Now, those are just a few books that inspired me. I picked them out though because what they all had in common was they made me believe the world could be different. And that is highly useful. By showing me a vision of the past in which queer people were always present, in which homophobia was not always present, and in which queer people were the protagonists of their own stories, these historians inspired me to believe that I could make a change as well. Now there's an important thing to note about this, and at the risk of biting the hand that brought me to Cambridge, only one of these people worked in the academy. They were all independent, community-based historians. Now, I believe there's two reasons why that was true. First of all, in the era in which Will and George and other folks were working in the 70s and 80s, you could forget getting tenure if your specialty was LGBTQ studies. It simply was not going to happen. But secondly, many of these writers and scholars did not see themselves first as academics, they saw their work as an act of activism. That by reclaiming the queer past, they could help shape a queer future. So they were not interested simply in publishing or perishing. They were interested in creating a vision of the past that would empower people in the present to create a different future. You'll notice that I have not mentioned much in the way of queer theory. And that is because I have not found that to be particularly useful in my work. This is a video from The Onion. If I read The Onion, you know what The Onion is? Um, it's a satirical website in the United States. It came out right after the election. Uh, in some ways, I find it the most provocative thing I could show you tonight. I voted for Donald Trump. I voted for Trump because I thought he'd create a better America for everyone. But after reading 800 or so pages on queer feminist theory, 
I realize now just how much I've been duped. I like Trump because I thought he tells it like it is. But you know who really tells it like it is? Judith Butler. Gender is not to culture as sex is to nature. Gender is also the discursive cultural means by which sex nature or a natural sex is produced and established as pre-decursive prior to culture, a politically neutral surface on which culture acts. If I had just known that back in November, I would have never voted for Trump. God, how could I have been so stupid? Now, I'm obviously poking a little fun at the thought of queer theory, but I think there's some truth in this satirical video, which, by the way, is actually several minutes long. I just gave you a clip from it. Which is that we have written ourselves into a corner in the field of queer studies, where for many people who are everyday people who simply want to know their past and their history, they can no longer understand what we're talking about. Now, I don't want to say all theory is useless. I don't believe that. There have been some theoreticians who have been enormously influential to me as an activist. Two of them are actually British, Andrew Hodges and David Hutter. Have any of you heard of this publication before? This publication was published in the early 1970s here in the UK with downcast gaze. And it was the first publication to develop the concept of what's called internalized homophobia, that the biggest obstacle in many ways that LGBTQ people face is the voice inside our head, which we have internalized from society that tells us that we are worthless and not of value. These theoreticians in the early 70s here in the UK were able to uncover that concept and explain it to their fellow activists so that they would understand what was holding them back from demanding their rightful place in society. Second theoretician who was enormously influential to me was a Caribbean American lesbian named Audrey Lorde. Um, I love this quote by Audrey. There is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Uh, Sarah and I were chatting on the way over. It's very interesting for those of us who are old fogies now to hear about intersectionality as if it is some incredibly new concept. Forty years ago, when I was a teenager, Audrey Lord was talking about intersectionality and saying to people, you cannot ask me to choose among the different parts of myself. You cannot ask me to be only black, or only a woman, or only a lesbian, or only Caribbean, or only of working class descent. That real liberation liberates all of us. That, as a young activist, was profoundly moving and effective for me, and it helped me understand why any meaningful queer activist would have to take on all of those issues. A third theoretician uh, who was very influential to me was Suzanne Farr. Suzanne Farr wrote a, a monograph in the 80s called Homophobia, a Weapon of Sexism, in which she explained that without sexism you cannot have homophobia. That homophobia is essentially a weapon to hold gender roles in their place. And she gave very concrete examples, if you think about it, what do you call the uh, little boy who doesn't throw the ball very well? He throws like a girl. He's a sissy, he's a fairy, he's a faggot. What do you say about the little girl who runs that little boy over at first base? She's a tomboy. She's butch. She's a dyke. Susan Farr was able to make the connection. We used to have these great buttons in the 80s. You probably remember Sarah. They used to say homophobia, racism, sexism, make the connections. Suzanne Farr was able to make the connection between homophobia and sexism and to show how they work together as two arms of the same system of oppression. So if you're a theorist, I don't dislike you, but I would urge you to think about how would someone in the real world use your theory <clears throat> and how would it help them to liberate themselves and other queer people. Folks like Audre Lorde and Suzanne Farr have shown the way for how theory can help liberate us all. So use them as role models. Been an activist for a long time now. This is me at my first Gay Pride March in 1986. There I am, marching with the Harvard Gay and Lesbian Caucus. And um, after 32 years of activism, I'm eager to pass the baton. I'm eager for this new generation to rise and show us what you can do and show us how you can lead us to a new level of liberation and freedom. 
I took that baton from a prior generation. In 1953, the first permanent gay rights group in America, the Madison Society, was founded in Los Angeles by Harry Hay. And one of the first things they decided to do was to publish a magazine called What? The first issue of One was seized by the U.S. Postal Service because any content, including homosexuality within it, whether it had sexuality in it or photos or drawings or anything, didn't have to have any of that. If it just talked about homosexuality, it was pornography. And it was illegal to mail pornography. So the first issue of One magazine, which had no illustrations, was impounded by the U.S. Postal Service. The Madison decided, decided, decided to fight back, and they sued. And it went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, where in the first decision on gay rights in American history in 1956, the Supreme Court struck down restrictions that prevented the mailing of One magazine. When I was in my graduate school at Columbia University, I decided that I wanted to write one of my papers about One Magazine, and I read every single issue. And I was particularly fascinated by the letters to the editor, because these were not the point of view of the editors. They were what average people were saying back to the editors. And this letter in particular spoke to me. I will always remain willing to support, in my small way, any effort to reduce intolerance toward a minority group in the United States. Intolerance is basically as un-American as communism. This is 1954. <laughs> I realize the road ahead of us is long and difficult, but that part of the road already traveled has been pretty tough, too. I realize the road ahead of us may be long and difficult, but that part of the road already traveled has been pretty tough, too. Words that were valid in 1954, words that would be valid still in 1963 when I was born and grew up in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, words that are valid in 2018 in Cambridge in the United Kingdom. There's a second reason why I found this letter moving. As I mentioned, you couldn't be known to be gay in the 1950s because you could lose everything, your job, your home, you could be institutionalized in a mental institution where you could be castrated or lobotomized. So many letters to the editor were signed simply with the location of the letter's author, not the author's name. This letter, which I found so moving in 1954, came from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. My If I had known this history when I was 16, I would not have tried to take my own life. If I had known that the most revered person in my family was a gay man, perhaps I wouldn't have struggled for so many years. What use is LGBT studies? It gives people their freedom. As I mentioned, it's time to handle the baton to your generation. And as we do so, um, I think of the words of Tony Benn, the British politician who many of you must know of, who said, every single generation has to fight the same battles again and again. There is no final victory and no final defeat. We live in what in many ways is a golden age for queer people, where our visibility is unmatched in modern times, where our legal rights, including the right to marry, are accessible to us in a way that has not been true in modern times. But that is not a final victory. As we are seeing with the rise of Trump in the United States and with the rise of various far-right groups here in the EU, or I guess I can still say that for another year, right? Here in the EU, um, those victories can be taken away from us. <coughs> And those victories were not won with the passage of time. After all, the gay artist Andy Warhol said, they always say time changes things, but you actually have to change them yourself. The existence of this lecture here at Cambridge University tonight, a lecture that would have been illegal in the United Kingdom 15 years ago, is because of people like my unnamed forebearer in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, in times that were much more difficult than the ones in which I've lived 
decided to stand up, fight back, and make a difference. We owe our freedoms that we take so often for granted today to those people who came before, who traveled a much more challenging and difficult road. And we owe it to them to be of use, to continue the fight, to produce scholarship that adds to liberation. It's my Uncle Mickey. I don't know much about his life because for obvious reasons, he concealed most of it from his nieces and nephews, my father and my aunts. I want to imagine that one of these men was his boyfriend. That in spite of the bigotry in which he lived, he was able to find happiness with another man. Sometimes as queer people, we have to imagine ourselves into a past from which we have been systematically erased. But that act of imagination is an act of liberation. Because if we cannot imagine a past in which we existed, how can we imagine a future in which we are liberated? So Uncle Mickey, 49 years later, you are not forgotten.